Welcome to Science Update. This is a Facebook Live session where I take a look at some recent discoveries in science and what they mean for the Christian faith. And today we're going to be taking on the question, does the use of medicinal plants by orangutans undermine the idea of human exceptionalism and along with it challenge the notion that human beings are made in God's image. We're going to be taking a look at a scientific discovery reported on by an international team of investigators who have studied orangutans in, in, in the forests of Indonesia for over 15 years, who have observed uh, orangutans making use of medicinal plants as anti-inflammatory agents. Uh, but before we do that, what I would like to do is remind you, as always, if you're watching this, please take a moment and check in. Let us know who you are and where you're watching from. This is valuable information for us to have. Uh, it allows me to uh, plan future broadcast, but also uh, it allows me to get a chance to, to know who you are. Also, react to this broadcast using the like button. Uh, the more likes that we get, the more interactions that we get with the broadcast, uh, the greater the visibility of the broadcast in the Facebook feed. And then also, if you have ways in which you think we can improve the broadcast, please let us know. Also, if you want to offer your perspective on this discovery, uh, does, again, the use of medicinal plants by orangutans undermine human exceptionalism and challenge the notion of the image of God? If you want to offer your perspective, please feel free to do so in the comment section. Uh, this broadcast is a sister broadcast to another Facebook Live session that we do uh, called Question of the Week. And my desire is to make both of these Facebook Live sessions as interactive as possible. So if you have a question that you'd like for me to address that deals with science faith issues, post those in the comment section, post them on my Facebook page, uh, send me a private message. Or if there is a scientific discovery that you've learned about that you would like for me to offer my comment on, please, again, post it in the comment section, post it on my Facebook page, or send me a private message. Okay, without any further ado, let's go ahead and take a look at this week's science update discovery. And the work that I want to talk about, again, was published by an international team of scientists who report in a recent issue of a journal called Scientific Reports, which is part of the Nature family of journals, uh, the results of observations they've made since 2003. And this international team has been studying orangutans in the forest of Indonesia. And specifically, they've been taking a look at, in, at, at orangutans in the Sabangal peat swamp forest, again, in Indonesia. And they've logged 20,000 observational hours over this time. And what they've noted is that in seven instances, they've seen female orangutans take the leaves of a particular plant uh, and chew those leaves, creating froth and foam in their mouth. And instead of swallowing the leaves, they actually spit the leaves out, but take that froth and that foam, and they rub it specifically on their left arms. And it's interesting because these are the arms that orangutan females will use to carry infants around with them. And so the researchers speculated that this may be an example of uh, orangutans engaged in self-medication, that maybe uh, this frothy material has something that in it that allows uh, the, the orangutans to experience relief from pain or soreness or inflammation. Uh, because that would result from carrying around an infant. Uh, and so they analyzed the extracts of uh, these, part these particular leaves and discovered that the extracts actually do indeed have anti-inflammatory properties. And so this is the first time that researchers have observed uh, orangutans, uh, great apes that are found in Asia, using plants for med medicinal purposes, for self-medication, and it's also the first time that anybody has observed uh, an animal of any sort using material from plants as a way to control inflammation. So this is 
a really exciting scientific discovery that's, again, made through painstaking uh, observation of these creatures in the wild. And for many people, when they see these kind of discoveries, it gives the impression that these great apes are like us in some way. In fact, one of the headlines that made the popular news outlets about this discovery said, orangutans, like people, use uh, medicinal plants to treat joint and muscle inflammation. And so when people see these kind of discoveries, they argue that this is sophisticated behavior that looks like it's the antecedent to the sophisticated behavior that we display as human beings, as modern humans. And they argue that this undermines human exceptionalism. It means that uh, creatures like orangutans are only different in degree, not kind, from human beings. And if that's the case, then it uh, erodes this notion that human beings bear God's image, because biblically human beings, according to scripture, are made in God's image, that we stand apart from all other creatures in this capacity, and that this capacity gives us the, the capability of having dominion over creation, of being God's stewards. And one view for the image of God is the resemblance view. And this particular view uh, would argue that we resemble God in some aspects, in some capacities, and that's what is meant by the image of God. And support for that view comes from passages like Colossians 3.10 or Ephesians 4.24 uh, that describes the image of God as uh, relating to knowledge and understanding, the capacity for love and for righteousness. And so the image of God, according to the New Testament, seems to be a set of qualities that we possess as human beings that cause us to stand apart. And if that's the case, then we should be unique compared to other creatures. We should be exceptional, particularly with respect to our cognitive abilities. But when we have discoveries like uh, orangutans self-medicating, that seems to undermine this notion of human exceptionalism. In fact, uh, people have observed uh, chimpanzees in the wild consuming plants, and the, check that, the leaves from plants that have, again, no food value, but cause them to vomit, and in doing so actually is a response to the in, um, being infected by an intestinal parasite. And so this is another example of self-medication. So again, people will point to these discoveries as, again, evidence that human beings are really only different in degree, not kind from other creatures. And in, in that's the case, again, I believe that it, it raises questions about the biblical view of humanity. But having said that, I would argue that this discovery, as remarkable as it is, is really mundane on the other hand, because I've already mentioned that chimpanzees engage in self-medication. In fact, this is a fairly widespread phenomena among uh, animal, among animal, among the animal kingdom. Uh, plant, uh, sorry, animals typically will make use of plants that have no food value for medicinal purposes. A lot of times, consuming plants that again cause them to regurgitate or help to clear out their intestinal tract from uh, parasites that would have in, would have infected them, so it protects them from pathogens. They might make use of plants to coat their skin and their fur to, again, treat infection, skin infections from pathogens or to alleviate uh, itching and irritation. And so when we see orangutans using these plants as a way for pain relief, that, again, uh, is just part and parcel of this widespread phenomena that has actually been given a name, uh, zoopharmacognosy, which zo means animal, pharma, uh, medicine, and cognosy awareness. That is, animals have an awareness that some plants have medicinal value, uh, just like plants have food value. And, and so, in a sense, while remarkable behavior, when we put this discovery of orangutans into a larger context, again, it's a rather mundane insight that really doesn't, I think, do any kind of damage to uh, the notion that human beings uh, are exceptional. And particularly when we compare uh, human technology when it comes to making use of plants for medicinal purposes to what we see with orangutans or chimpanzees or the other great apes. Because uh, as human beings, when we first appear on the scene, there was the sociocultural Big Bang, where we seemed to stand apart from all other creatures. 
on the planet. And though initially our technology, though more sophisticated than even that of the Neanderthals, was primitive and archaic, and humans would have made use of plants in much the same way for medicinal purposes. Indigenous people in Indonesia, for example, make use of the same leaves as the, of, the, of the plant that the orangutans make use of for this very same function as an anti-inflammatory uh, material. Uh, over the span that we've been here on Earth, though we started off, again, making primitive use of plants for medicinal purposes, we now have created a, an, an industrial pharmaceutical complex where we uh, not only isolate individual compounds from plants and then figure out how to synthesize them in the laboratory, making those compounds available for people all over the world to treat illnesses and, and infections in, in diseases, but we actually, from a fundamental understanding of biochemistry, can develop de novo novel compounds that are unlike anything in nature that we can use for drug purposes. So when you compare what human beings are doing with what, again, you see uh, orangutans and chimpanzees doing, uh, it's a night and day difference. And that difference uh, has to do to some quality that we possess as human beings that's distinct from the orangutans. And it's undoubtedly due to our capacity for symbolism, our open-ended uh, generative capacity that is we can take ideas and embed them one in another to create alternate hypotheses, uh, alternate scenarios. But also we have theory of mind that allows us to communicate with each other uh, in, a, in a very deep and sophisticated way. And when you put this all together, this is why we could take primitive technology and in a very short uh, period of time, uh, turn it into, again, a, a pharmaceutical industrial complex that, again, I think is an embodiment of the fact that we possess qualities that are very different from other creatures. Uh, and that those qualities is what we would call the image of God. Uh, I think symbolism and theory of mind and open-ended generative capacities are scientific descriptors of what we would understand as Christians to be the image of God. Now, this insight uh, with regard to the work uh, studying orangutans in the wild has a, another implication that's really very important. And that has to do with the question, were Neanderthals like us? Did Neanderthals display an, an exceptional quality to them? Were Neanderthals in possession of advanced cognitive abilities, much like modern humans? And there are some anthropologists who would argue that the answer to that question is yes. Uh, and one uh, piece of evidence that's cited in favor of quote-unquote Neanderthal exceptionalism is the use of medicinal plants by Neanderthals. In the last couple of years, there's been a research team that has done some very interesting work where they've analyzed uh, dental calculus from the teeth of Neanderthals. And uh, calculus is this hardened dental plaque. And when, when dental plaque forms, it'll trap microorganisms and food debris that's present in the mouth. And eventually when it hardens, it'll form a, a record of sorts of what that particular uh, creature was consuming by way of food and the types of microorganisms that were infecting its mouth and a respiratory tract. Well, these researchers studying dental calculus from Neanderthals, from the Spy Cave in Belgium and the El Cidron Cave System in, in Spain, these Neanderthals date in the 50 to 40,000 year window of time, discovered uh, doing trace chemical analysis of the dental calculus from the Neanderthals at El Cidron that they were consuming a vegetarian diet almost exclusively uh, and that some of the, the, the plants that they were consuming had no food value, that they would have been useful for medicinal purposes, but they would have tasted extremely bitter and they would have been very unpleasant to consume. And so they reasoned that Neanderthals had a capacity for self-medication. Uh, just recently, the same research team looked at ancient DNA from dental calculus in Neanderthals, and they could catalog the types of microorganisms that were in uh, the, the dental plaque of Neanderthals, as well as the types of food materials that they would have consumed. And they discovered that Neanderthals from the spy cave in Belgium were eating largely a meat-based diet, but for the El Cidron Neanderthals, they were consuming, again, a vegetarian diet. But one of the Neanderthal specimens, which was a teenager that had a, a severe dental abscess, 
as well as had ancient DNA from a eukaryotic parasite that would have caused diarrhea and some very se severe intestinal discomfort, they found trace amounts of uh, salicylic acid, which must have come from a plant that the Neanderthal consumed that may very well have had painkiller properties. Also, they discovered trace amounts of the mold penicillin, penicillium, which produces the, the antibiotic penicillin. So they reasoned that these Neanderthals had a sense for, again, antibiotic materials from the environment, natural antibiotics that could be used to treat infections. And they thought it was interesting that this particular individual that was sick was actually consuming these materials. And again, they argued, well, this is clearly evidence that Neanderthals had advanced cognitive abilities, like us, like human beings. But again, when you think about this whole phenomena of zoopharmacognosy, this could just simply be another example of zoopharmacognosy where Neanderthals, like other animals, have an understanding that some plants have medicinal value, and it's nothing more than that. It's not any kind of indication of sophisticated ability among Neanderthals. And again, something else that, that reinforces that conclusion is a comparison of the trajectory of Neanderthal technology compared to the trajectory of human technology. Neanderthals were actually on the planet longer than human beings had been on the planet. Neanderthals appear between 200 and 250,000 years ago and go extinct roughly uh, 50,000 years ago. And in that window of time, towards the end of their time on Earth, they were using plants for medicinal purposes in a very similar way to chimpanzees and orangutans. But yet again, when modern humans appear on the scene, again, we would have initially made use of medicinal plants much in the same way as other animals would have, but in very short order, we again created this industrial pharmacological complex. And so when you look at the trajectory of how our technology unfolds, again, compared to Neanderthals, it's highlighting our exceptional nature. There has to be something about humans that explains that very steep evolution uh, uh, in terms of complexity of human technology, and that would be symbolism, open-ended generative capacity, and theory of mind, qualities that I would argue reflect the image of God. So ironically, this uh, announcement of orangutans making use of plants for medicinal purposes like people doesn't undermine the notion of human exceptionalism. It actually supports the notion of human exceptionalism if we very carefully think through what these results actually mean in a broader context of evidences. Now, uh, why does it make so much difference for us to spend time worrying about what Neanderthals could and couldn't do? Couldn't we just simply say, look, the Bible teaches that human beings are made in the image of God, and regardless of what Neanderthals were doing, it doesn't diminish the fact that the Bible teaches us that we are unique, that we bear the image of God, and that we can, again, uniquely be in a relationship with God, and that the image of God is the foundation for human rights and for the, the inherent value and worth and dignity that all human beings possess. Why couldn't we just simply argue that? Well, we can. In fact, I see a number of people who particularly embrace theistic evolution make that, that kind of an argument. But I would actually respond by saying, again, a careful assessment of what Scripture teaches about the image of God indicates that it's the resemblance view, not the representative view or the relational view that really is what Scripture is teaching that, can, that the image of God, uh, or that defines the image of God. And that means we must be exceptional and distinct from all other creatures. And if Neanderthals were like us in some way with respect to advanced cognitive abilities, it's very hard to argue that human beings are exceptional, that we stand apart from uh, other creatures, because that would simply not be the case. And while it may bring us comfort in, as Christians to say it doesn't matter what we learn about Neanderthals, I'm still going to embrace this notion that we bear the image of God as human beings, when we actually try to engage people that are not Christians, that are, that are steeped in the sciences, or that are strongly influenced by what comes out of the scientific community, that kind of posture to make a theological assertion does nothing to convince them that Christianity is valid. In fact, it does the opposite. It indicates to them that Christians have no interest in what the scientific data is saying, and they're going to embrace 
theological ideas on, on the basis of blind, uninformed faith as opposed to based on evidence and on reasoned faith. And so when we take this position that, you know, it doesn't matter what is true about Neanderthals one way or the other, the Bible teaches us that human beings bear God's image. Again, it's a view that we can hold as Christians, but it does us no favor and no good when it comes to uh, evangelism whatsoever. Uh, and moreover, if we really begin to undermine the notion of human exceptionalism, I think we, we strip away ideas that are foundational to uh, concerns about human dignity, value, and worth. We, we strip away any kind of basis for advocating for justice in our world, for advocating for human rights in our world. Uh, and so the consequences are far ranging uh, when it comes to what we think about human origins and even what we think about Neanderthals. So that's why I'm, I spend so much time uh, obsessing about what Neanderthals could do from a behavioral standpoint, because the implications, in my view, are incredibly profound. And in fact, I've written a number of articles uh, to begin the, year, the new year on Neanderthal behavior and capabilities, uh, and I've got a few more that are in the queue that will be coming soon. So uh, go to my blog, The Cells Design, that's hosted on our website, www.reasons.org, and check out those articles. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and bring things to a close. Thank you so much for watching. This has been Science Update, a Facebook Live session where we look at recent discoveries in science and what they mean for the Christian faith. I want to make this interactive, so if you've got a discovery that you've learned about that you want me to comment on, again, communicate that to me through uh, the comment section of this broadcast or uh, through uh, private message or even just post it on my Facebook page. Also, if there is a, a question that you have about the relationship between science and the Christian faith, I would like to take that on as part of another Facebook Live broadcast I do called Question of the Week. And then I would remind you again to check in, let us know who you are, where you're watching from, react to the broadcast with the like button, and then let me know what you think about uh, Neanderthal and uh, orangutan self-medication. Is this really something that's critical for the Christian faith, or is this a side issue? I'm going to leave you with one final thought, and that's this. The more that we know about science, the more that we have reasons to believe. God bless you. See you next time.